Good morning, everybody. My name is Jessie Durbin. I'm the Instructional Design and Training Manager at Valley Mountain Regional Center. On behalf of all the members and the management of VMRC, I would like to extend a very warm welcome and good wishes to all the new hires who are attending this onboarding event. Congratulations to all of you. I would also like to convey my heartfelt gratitude to all the panelists and speakers who have taken out time from their busy schedules to share and present about their departments and services. A big thank you to all of you. This event would not have been possible without you. Uh, let me briefly share the agenda for today so that we all are on the same page. And I would just request everybody to please keep their mics on mute. So let me share my screen. So that's the agenda for today. So the first thing that's going to come up is the new hire introduction. I'd just like to mention that there are about 40 new hires who are attending this event and about 30 speakers presenting over two days. I would be introducing the panelists as and when they're about to present. We would request all the new hires to introduce themselves. Uh, we prepared a list of order of introduction for the new hires. I would request Doug to kindly share it in the chat section so, so that all the new hires know the order of uh, you know, when they have to be introducing themselves. And for your information, the list is in an alphabetic order. There were some people who wanted to join us, so we added them at the last minute. So just in case your name does not appear on the list, it's just human error, so please feel free to introduce yourself. And once the initial introduction of the new hires is done, I would request Mr. Tony Anderson to say a few words. And from there onwards, we're going to proceed ahead with the presentations of our speakers as per the agenda. So I'll just let the agenda stay here for a few more seconds. So we would try our best to stick to the flow and the time limits. We all understand that these are challenging times and everybody has a very busy schedule. I would need assistance from each one of you in respecting the time and schedule for all so that we do not overshoot the time limit and make this event a success. Uh, before we proceed ahead with the introductions of the new hires, let me briefly introduce myself. So I joined Valley Mountain Regional Center about three years back as a service coordinator and joined the HR department in my present position this year. My immediate supervisor is Mr. Badman Leeks, and presently I'm looking after the training needs of VMRC. As far as my background is concerned, I have more than 25 years of experience working in different organizations, and I have multiple degrees under my belt. So in case there's any area where you feel that you need assistance or some kind of training to facilitate you or your staff, please do not hesitate in reaching out to me. Now, I do not claim to be a walking encyclopedia, but I can assure you that I would try my best to arrange for the right trainings to optimally assist you with your position. So moving ahead with the agenda, we would request each new hire to briefly introduce themselves. So I would just like to mention the list is in the chat section. And one by one, we would request you to please introduce yourselves. So over to the new hires. I'll be bringing everybody in uh, to this as a panelist when it's your turn. So first up, go ahead, Nissi. Hi, I'm Nissi. I am a service coordinator for the adult, for the adult section. Uh, my, sorry, I'm kind of nervous. There's so many people on. <laughs> um, my supervisor is Karen Jensen. Um, my background, I actually came from the day program. I was a program director for the day program over in the Bay Area, um, specifically Fremont. I'm originally from the Bay Area. I'm a San Jose native. So moving, we made the big move because of cheaper housing <laughs> over on this side. So I'm still trying to learn my way around still at the same time. I finally get to live in my house. We bought our house two years ago, but we haven't really fully moved in till like this year. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Nissi. Up next is Vanessa Astorga. Okay, hello. We hear you. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, my name is Vanessa. Uh, uh, I'm on, on the children's team with Panther. I'm really excited. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, I would just like the new hires to, you know, just follow the list. Uh, we don't, you know, we really thankful that you are present here, but let's just follow the list and we'll make sure that we thank you and welcome you towards end of, you know, once everybody's presented. So we are welcoming you and, but we don't want to just come in between and spoil the flow by just interrupting in between. So as soon as one person has introduced, we would request the next person to just start introducing themselves. So the next one is Vanessa Alexander. And if the person is not there, it's perfectly fine if the next one jumps in. Okay. Hi, my name is Vanessa Alexander. I am a service coordinator on the children's team with Julie. Um, started as an intern and as soon as I graduated from Sac State, go Hornets, <laughs> I transferred over as a full-time service coordinator. So that's me. <laughs> Thank you. The next on the list is Ray. And we could always come back to Ray's. Uh, if Janet is there, we'll move ahead to with Janet's introduction. Sarah. Sarah, are you there? Yeah, Janet is here. Oh, Janet is there? Okay. All right, Janet. Hi, um, my name is Janet Vasquez Bautista. I am the service coordinator for children also. I am on Liz's team. Um, I've been here three weeks. This is my third week now. <laughs> Originally, I'm from down south, so I'm still trying to figure everything um, everything out up here. I moved here. I moved up here in January, so still pretty new to, to this area, to NorCal. So, yeah, but it's been good so far. <laughs> Welcome. We have Sarah. Yes. Hello, I'm Sarah Bellin. I am in the children's unit. Um, Daniel, Daniel Walls is my program manager. Um, prior to this, I am a recent college grad. So this is my first big girl job and I'm more than happy to be here working with everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So the next one on the list is Timothy. I don't see Timothy's name listed as an attendee unless he's one of the ones that called in. Is he one of the phone numbers? I'm not sure. So maybe we could come back to Timothy, you know, as and when he's ready. Let's move ahead with Brett. Are you there, Brett? Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Brett Bungie. I've been here for about two months since early September. And I worked for the ARC of Spokane in Washington State for three years. And then I worked for DRAIL briefly. And now I am an adult service coordinator under Rhonda Trout. Welcome, Brett. Uh, the next one is Jay Ree. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name correct. That's why I wanted you to introduce yourselves. But Jay Ree Clayton, and please correct me if I've not pronounced your name correctly. Um, close enough, but it's jury. <laughs> uh, and uh, trust me, I've been called worse, so that was good. <laughs> um, but good morning, everybody. My name is Jury Clayton, um, like Jesse said, and um, I am a service coordinator, and my program manager is Erin, so I work with adults, and I am also a Southern California native, just like Janet, so um it's been fun being up here. It's cold now. I like the cold, so I'm excited. Um, 
and I'm just happy to be here and get started working and working with everybody. Thank you. Uh, the next one is Brenda Collins. Good morning, my name is Brenda Collins. I am an office technician in Modesto, front desk. I've been here about two months and I have a wide variety of a background. <laughs> so, <laughs> hi, Christine. <laughs> Welcome, Brenda. Uh, the next on the list is Noel de la Cruz. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name's Noel. Um, I am in, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm in the children's unit. My super uh, program manager is uh, Angelique Shear. Um, I started Valley Mountain Regional Center in actually the end of June. Um, it's been great so far. I used to work for Family Resource and Referral um, so I've been working with children and families for over 10 years, and I was born and raised in Stockton. I know the town and the county pretty well, uh, so I'm glad to be a part of this team and this agency. Thank you. Welcome to VMRC. So the next one on the list is Daisy. I mean, hello, my name is Daisy Di Giovanni. Um, I am a senior, I mean, I'm a service coordinator from Early Start in Modesto, and my manager is Linda Barr. I've been working with um, MUSD for six years, so I started in May, so it's been new. It's interesting because I have tons, I have three kids and two dogs, so it's trying to, trying to learn a new job and my kids online, so it's been interesting. This year's been very interesting, so yeah. Thank you. Jacqueline Dunn. Hi, everyone. I'm an Early Start Service Coordinator. Um, my program manager is Linda Barr. Um, I started back in June, and before that, I was an in-home ABA therapist for five years. Thank you. The next one is Brianna Gall. Hi everyone, my name is Brianna Gall. I'm a service coordinator for Danielle Wells on the Legends team. Um, I was born and raised in Stockton. I graduated from University of the Pacific. Um, before this, I owned a business for like six or seven years with my ex-husband and we have a five-year-old little boy in town. So, and then I came here. Welcome. Thank you. Benjamin Gonzalez, Jr. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Benjamin. I'm with the uh, Children's Service. I'm a service coordinator for uh, the Children's Unit with Angelique Shear. Uh, I'm also from Stockton. My background, I've done a variety of education jobs and recently ABA therapy. I'm really happy to be with the company. Welcome. Thank you. The next one on the list is Gregoria Gonzalez. And please do correct me if I'm not pronouncing your names correct. Hi there. Okay, we can always come back. And the next one is Renato. Hi, Renato. good morning. My name is Renato or Renato, if you speak Spanish. Um, I just want to say go Dodgers. Finally got one. So I'm sure, or at least I hope there's a few other fans in here. Um, I started um, about two months ago and I'm in Nidra's team uh, for transitions. Really sad about her news, but also very happy and excited for her. Um, I took this job so that I can spend more time with this thing on my lap. And um, yeah, I'm, I might be leaving a few times to change some diapers, but uh, I'm still here. Welcome. Uh, the next one on the list is Sadra Hallam. Hi, my name is Sadra Hallam, and I've been with VMRC um, since May. I got hired in the pandemic. I have 20 years background in special education and decided to jump, make the move um, after there was so much craziness in education. I'm a service coordinator, um, early start under Linda Barr, and this has been my dream job. Welcome. 
hair eyes. Are you there, hair? I'm, I'm here. Um, I'm Ice Her, and I am a service coordinator for Liz Diaz in the children's unit. Um, it's been great so far. I absolutely love everyone that I'm working with and the work that I'm doing. Um, for the last 20 years, I've been working with children, um, mainly with early childhood education. And prior to coming here, I was working in the East Bay as head of schools for a Montessori school. Welcome. Sanjam Hundal. Hi, my name is Sanjam. I'm a service coordinator in the children's unit. I'm on Julie De Diego's team. I started in June and I've already learned so much in such a short time. Um, and before that, I was working for Loda Unified for the past three years. So excited to be here. Welcome. The next one is Cindy Jimenez. Good morning. I'm Cindy Jimenez. I started working at BMRC about 26 years ago in children's. I transferred to uh, Early Start and I was a senior service coordinator there for a while. I then left to work for, at the time we had four Early Start comprehensive program vendors and I worked for all four of them before coming back to BMRC in children's. Then I went back to Early Start uh, then I transferred to a program manager position in children's, uh, and I did that up to about two and a half years ago, uh, and I had to leave at that time, but I'm back now as a part-time manager on a new adolescent team. I just threw it all together. And I'm so happy to be back, and this is the best place to work, best, best people. All of you new people out there, this is, this is where you want to be. Don't think the grass is greener. It's not. This is where you want to stay. Right, Chris? Thank you, Cindy. Uh, the next one is Yang Lor. Are you there, Yang? Okay, we'll move ahead to Alicia Loza. Good morning, everybody. Hi, my name is Alicia Loza. I am... I'm a new hire for the adult unit, and my supervisor or my manager is um, Marianne Gonzalez. Um, I was also hired at the end of June. It's been a very um, interesting transition. Um, we're uh, learning everything via Zoom, um, but so far, so far, it's been pretty good. I have a wide um, range background working in the mental health field. I'm also a substance abuse counselor, so. In addition to working in VMRC, I also work with those struggling with um, substance use disorder. So that's just a little bit about me, and I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, Logan. Hi there. My name is Logan Malave. Uh, I'm working in the San Andreas office on the Children's Transition Transitions team. Um, I started in March, uh, just about four days before we all got sent home. Um, so I've learned the majority of the job from my daughter's bedroom, as I am in right now. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been great so far. It's been a lot of fun. My background is uh, in a group care home. My mom owned and operated uh, a care home up here for, for years and years and years. So that's where I lived and that's where I got my experience and um, went to college for something totally different and came back to work in this field that I'm so close to. So I'm happy to be here with you guys. Welcome, Logan. Thank you. The next one is Nicole Marjun. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the last name correct. Nick. I didn't see her on the list. I don't know if she's one of the phone numbers. Uh, I'll bring over, the, why don't I bring over the phone numbers at the end and anybody who we missed and we could just go to the next. Okay, so the next one is Athena Miles. Hi everyone, I'm Athena. Um, I'm the new fiscal assistant. I'm working under Debbie. Um, I, I'm not a baseball fan, but I am a basketball fan. Go Lakers. <laughs> um, I've been doing accounting since 2011. Uh, I have a few other things, data entry and a little bit of management that I've done in between. So 
I'm just happy to be back in accounting because that's what I love to do. <laughs> Thank you, Adina. Thank and you. Shanna. Annabelle, are you there? Good morning, everyone. I'm Annabelle. I joined VMRC. Um, actually, my background just cleared before the world shut down. Um, so in April, I'm very happy to be here. I have a lot of respect for everyone in this company. I am on the children's unit um, with Pam. And uh, my background, I'm a service coordinator, and my background um, is in behavioral coaching. So I did that for several years um, and worked a little bit with ABA. So my passion is to work with people. So I'm very excited to be here with everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. Weston. Hi, I'm Weston. I started in January uh, at the transition unit uh, in Modesto, Niger's team. Um, just was kind of getting the hang of things and then March rolled around and boom, here we are. So I had to hit the reset button and relearn a lot, a lot, a lot of things. Uh, been an interesting year, but um, I'm from East Tennessee. So um, nobody knows anything about that, but uh, I, I grew about two hours outside of Atlanta. So um, the Dodgers have broken my heart and then my spirit, um, but I'll just move along. I was in Memphis for about six years or so. And uh, during that time, I went back to school to get my master's in counseling. And then I stayed at the University of Memphis for a, a post-secondary ed transition um, program there, something like uh, the Fresno State Wayfinders program. So that's where I'm coming from. My wife is from this area. So we moved out here to be closer to the family. And, and now here we are. So glad to be here. Welcome, Weston. Casey. Casey Robertson. Hi, my name. My name is Casey Robertshaw. I'm a service coordinator at the San Andreas office um, for the children's team. My program manager is Rhonda Trout. Before this, I was a substitute teacher for four years and a paraeducator for two. Uh, I started here in March and I'm loving it. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Michelle Romero. Um, hold on, sorry. Hi, my name is Michelle Romero, and I'm a service coordinator with um, an early start with Nikki Gillespie. Um, I started back in July, and um, I have background about like 12 years of experience working with um, infants and toddlers. So this is like my dream job too. And I'm originally from the Bay Area, so I'm a big Warriors and Raiders fan. <laughs> um, and that's it. Oh, we've recently moved here like a well, not recent, but we moved here like three years ago from, um, I'm from San Jose. So um, this is a different change, but um, I'm definitely loving um, this job and uh, but just, I'm just trying to get used to everything. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. The next one is Margaret Romo. Margaret, are you there? We'll move ahead, Stephanie Summerfield. Stephanie, are you there? Hello, sorry, I was trying to connect. Um, my name is Stephanie and I am an early start service coordinator in Modesto. My program manager is Linda Barr. Um, I've been here since the end of June and before this, I was a behavioral therapist um, and Modesto as well. So I'm a Modesto native. <laughs> Welcome. Lou Tao. Lou was another name I didn't see signed in. So he may be a, a phone number that we can bring over at the end. Okay, so we move ahead. Matthew Tweet. Hi, my name is Matt. Um, I started in um, April 1st, believe it or not. So I'm the April Fool of the company. Um, I am a Dodgers fan and just as importantly, a service coordinator. So um, we're riding high this morning. I've left my house, I think six times since I got hired and um, learning everything from the couch and um, having a good time. Welcome, Jaslyn Valencia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jaslyn Valencia. Um, I'm an early start service coordinator with on Trisha Simmons team. 
Um, before this, I worked in ABA therapy um, programs for a few years. So I was on the other side of VMRC. And now um, I joined VMRC in May. So it's been a nice pandemic so far. <laughs> The next one we have on the list is Azuchina Vera. And correct me if I'm not pronouncing your name appropriately, please. Good morning, everyone. My name is Azuchina Vera. Um, I am a service coordinator here in the Stockton office um, under Danielle Wells. Uh, before this, I was a, um, I have a little bit of background with ABA, um, and then also I worked with um, a lot of behaviors and helping families. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Welcome. Yesenia Victoria. She was another one. I don't see her name listed, so she might be a phone number as well. Okay. Deanna Wagenman. Deanna Wagenman. Okay. okay, I'll move ahead. Jessica Zamora. Okay. There's Deanna. Go ahead, Deanna. Oh. Sorry, I was having some connect connection issues. I'm Deanna Wagenman. I am in the Stockton office. I'm on the children's team with Elizabeth Diaz. Um, my, I got hired in July, so I've been here almost four months. And I came from Children's Home of Stockton, the group home. So I was a youth counselor for at-risk youth. Welcome. Jessica. Hi, good morning. My name is Jessica Samora. I'm a children's service coordinator and my program manager is Dania Wells. Prior to being employed with um, VMRC, I was a transition service coordinator with Alta California Regional Center. Hi, nice to meet you all. Welcome, Jessica. Uh, Doug, do we have some people over the phone? Yes, I brought everybody that uh, over. Um, Nick, Ray, Gregoria, okay. Yang, Margaret, um, and then a couple phone numbers. So if you guys want to jump in and go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Margaret Romo. I am an SOT in the clinical department. Uh, Chrissy Lopez is my manager. I've been here at BMRC now for um, just about three months. Um, before coming to BMRC, I was a um, SLS worker and a DSP. Um, I love assisting those that are in need and um, just like being out in the community. Um, now I'm here and I can't wait to see what um, becomes of working with BMRC. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Hi, my name is Gregoria Gonzalez. I am an Early Star Service Coordinator uh, with um, the Liros in Stockton. My manager is um, Tricia Simmons. And um, a little bit of my background, I used to be at home. And after my children started school, I went to school and I graduated in uh, 2013 from CSU Stanislaus with a BA in sociology. And I plan to be a social worker, but I ended working with uh, little children and I love to stay in this area. So I'm glad to be here at BMRC. Thank you and welcome. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Yang. I work, my program manager is Mary Ann. Um, I work in the adult Stockton Side. Um, I'm actually from Rhode Island. I moved here to California about a year now. Um, I started working for VMRC um, just this January. Um, I started with Weston. We had training together. Um, yeah, and I graduated from University of Rhode Island. Thank you. Dick Marjan, I'm um, also from the SOC and adult team. Uh, Mary Ann Gonzalez, uh, service coordinator, and I started in July, so it's been about four months, and it's going very well. I'm originally from New Mexico, um, very new to trying to figure out the Stockton area, but um, recently moved to Stockton. Hi, my name is Jessica Zamora. I'm a social 
Do we have some more? Miss Dillon, uh, can you all hear me? Mr. Bonnet, Miss Strotterman, Miss Couch, Mr. Yes. Bell, okay. So I guess I'm last. Okay, Ray Boggio, office technician at your service here, based out of the Stockton area. It's a good. Sorry, I don't have the camera that you don't see my face. It's a good thing I'm not very pleasant to look at. I think uh, uh, the Mr. Ben they would uh, they would uh, agree with that. But it, basically, here I've started since August 3rd, 2020. I was onboarded as again office technician, and so far my position. Uh, for the past few months has been to be a lean, mean vendorization machine. So for the good 70 to 80 percent of people that are uh, on the onboarding, I'm very thankful because now I know what you look like and I've worked on some cases with you folks. But it's been a really great journey so far. Again, to uh, I uh, answer to Miss Karina Ramirez, which also answer or I also answer to Mr. Brian Bennett. Shout out to him in your eighth uh, uh, quartile there if you can see him but yes so far the journey has been very well and i'm the learning more service codes to coordinate so thank you and happy wednesday thank you doug do we still have some more online i think we got everybody unless if somebody didn't get to introduce themselves if you want to just uh let us know in the chat and i can move you over but i think we got everybody so for all the new hires, congratulations once again on joining Valley Mountain Regional Center. Thank you for introducing yourselves. Uh, we hope that you have an enriching and fruitful tenure with us at VMRC, and we truly appreciate your services and all the work that you're doing, especially during these pandemic times. Uh, I would now request Mr. Tony Anderson, our executive director and the man behind this event, to say a few words. And after that, we would begin with the presentations of the speakers. Uh, Tony, over to oh, you. All right. Well, thank you so much. And so great to see, see that we've got so many great uh, uh, baseball fans out there. I'm not going to be partisan at all about which team you should have been rooting for. You may have noticed that there are a lot of people rooted for the right team. But uh, whatever team you root for, that's fine with all of us. Uh, we're um, so excited, though, to have everybody here. Um, and I want to just say that this was wonderful to hear um, so many people and your backgrounds. I want to share a little bit, too, of my background. I'm from, uh, I'm from Long Beach, Long Beach, California, down in Southern California. And uh, so uh, born and raised down there in uh, that's why I'm a Dodger fan, Laker fan, and Rams are going to be next, so whatever. But um, I uh, also started in this field in 1987. Now, I know some of you were pretty young in 1987, like maybe not even born. But, hey, that's, that's what happens when you get to be as old as I am. But um, 1987 is when I started in the field, and I was uh, working in a – in a group home. And it sounded like a few of you had worked in homes before. I also worked in day programs and did behavioral uh, work as well. So uh, I'm hearing those themes as well, uh, uh, job coaching, I did that. I worked in schools, I heard uh, some of that as well. So um, I've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of experiences that it sounds like all of you have um, in your background. So I'm really excited to see uh, that you've all uh, you've all come to us from uh, from all these different parts of our community. It's so important, um, and uh, I did want to also. I actually wanted to make sure I uh, I stay on time, so I'm going to just now start my timer. I'm also famous for not staying within my time limit, so you'll have to excuse me if that occurs. But I'm sure that won't happen. Um, the other uh, parts of my background, I just want to uh, let you know about, is that. Uh, uh, not only was I a direct support professional for many years, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from people with disabilities. I learned a lot from other DSPs um, and families as well. And um, it's, it's really helped me and it helps me in the decisions that we make even today. So um, I also spent quite a bit of time in the policy world. I, I worked for Governor Gray Davis for a while as a, a policy on developmental disabilities. 
uh, policy, developmental services policy. Um, I was a lobbyist. Um, so I had spent about 15 years in the Capitol. So any of the laws that you see in your new work as you come across uh, that you like, uh, you can thank me because I had something to do with it. And the ones that you don't like, um, well, sorry about that. It was a good idea at the time. So um, you'll, you will, uh, you'll will notice that the regional center is not an island uh, uh, unto itself. Right? We are part of a, uh, a very large system. And in California, we are extremely fortunate uh, that we have the system that we have. The Lanterman Act is um, our uh, driving force. The Lanterman Act is what we look at all of the time. Uh, the, it's a beautiful piece of legislation. It's a great story. Uh, and if you when you get a chance and throughout your career, no matter what position you work in our organization, that uh, the Lanterman Act is uh, something that you should all uh, uh, read and you will get a sense of why we're all here, why we're even created in the first place. Well, the story in the Lanterman Act is, is actual a beautiful story. Um, it starts though from a very dark time right in our history not just in america not just in california but uh you know throughout the world there were many countries who uh, treated people with developmental disabilities uh the same way and that is without respect um if you uh, whether or not you know this um i'm not sure but the there was a time in our world where if uh, uh, a, a mother had their baby the doctor might say that uh, this baby was born with a developmental disability. So therefore uh, you should remove this baby from society and we will take over and we will institutionalize this baby. You need to go home, talk to your husband and start all over and forget this ever happened. Um, that, I mean, that sounds pretty harsh. It is very harsh and, and it actually did happen many, many times throughout um, our history. And it's a reason for the Lanterman Act, it's a, one of the core reasons for creating a community system because the reason they did that was there was no regional center system. There was no community system in place. And so that was the reaction. If there's nothing, then the only thing they did have were state institutions. So we are very fortunate to be part of the solution of that problem way back when. Um, but it's, if you think about history, I know many of you are young and you may think that the 60s is um, a long, long, long time ago. But if, if you really look in history, that's not that long ago. And uh, that's the time that we're talking about. That's uh, the time where this uh, started to occur. And actually the late 60s is when we created the beginnings of the Lanterman Act. So we all have this great mission Again, no matter what you're doing, you're having some piece, you're having some piece of the solution and that to that issue of people being part of their society. So if if part of our core history was that people were removed and were isolated, we create the regional centers to break down those barriers. And that's we're still having to do that today. And that is the what what you're all doing in many ways. You're either helping families so that the barriers that are in place for them to participate fully and to do the things that other families can do, um, that, that we are helping them so that they can overcome the barriers and that they can uh, participate like any other family in any ways that they do in society. And for people with disabilities, critically important work that you're doing because it may not be as obvious as it was uh, many years ago where you overtly heard from professionals who removed people from society. It may not be that obvious anymore. And we're doing tremendous work in our state to, to uh, not have any more developmental centers. Um, there'll be a time where none of you will ever heard of a developmental center and, and that will be a great thing. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't need some highly resourced and professional uh, resources and, and services um, for some people with some very serious behavioral needs or uh, medical needs. We're still going to need that. 
but when the reaction was as a default to put people in these institutional settings, when that was the reaction, that's what uh, our regional center uh, system is a response to. And again, you're all joining us to be part of this solution. Now, you gotta remember that people uh, with developmental disabilities, as I said, um, you know, they, we, we found different stages of bringing them, uh, of integrating people into the community. And uh, we're still trying to get better at that. I'm not saying that we're all perfect on this, uh, in this area yet, but um, we just keep learning. And that's what I would, I would want you to do here at the regional center is that whatever we're, we're uh, doing, whatever path we're on, that uh, it's not the final that we're constantly learning how to be a, a better um, a better resource for people with developmental disabilities and for their families so that they can meet the mission of our organization so we would need we want to hear their voices so you'll see in our our mission statement that we talk about uh, their choice and that they are integrating into the uh, community and that they can do things because they have choice that may sound benign to some people but when your choices are taken away, it's extremely important that we fight for their, uh, the ability of their voices to be heard and for them to express the things that they want and that they have a variety of choices. So um, that's another big thing that we're all doing. And again, I can't say it enough. It doesn't matter what position you work here at the regional center, you are all doing a part that addresses these issues and advances what we're working for. So um, I want to thank you for for that piece. The other piece I've, I've got to uh, express to everybody is that the regional center system, which Valley Mountain Regional Center is a part of, is a very special system. When I talk about the Lanterman Act, um, it's a critical piece of legislation for us all, but uh, it's a piece of uh, statute for us. And, um, but it's not everywhere. It's actually, I don't know if you know this or not, but it's the only state in the union that has uh, a in law, a written in law uh, in their developmental services system that every person in California uh, with a developmental disability will be served. And uh, in other states, what you do uh, in your advocacy in the state capitals there is you work on trying to reduce the amount of people that are on the waiting list. And that is not, that doesn't mean a waiting list for actual services. Um, you're just waiting for a certain program. You're actually waiting to even get into the system in most of these states. And, and when I say most, I'm saying almost every single one of them. And, and there are a couple who don't have uh, waiting list, but in law, you could have them there. So, and there's only a couple of those. Ours is the only one that by law, you cannot have one. So our state has made a major commitment to people with developmental disabilities and their families. And it's through the Lanterman Act. And um, uh, that we will always uh, secure for our, our community. And um, I wanna, again, say thank you to everybody here. Um, that was amazing uh, seeing your faces or hearing your voices and a great energy. And I love the background that every, all the different places people are coming from. And I wanna say to you all, thank you for coming to be a part of the Valley Mountain Regional Center team. And uh, thank you for helping us continue on with, the, with our mission at, at Valley Mountain Regional Center to, uh, make sure that people have their voices heard and that they are able to make choices and that we are um, empowering our community. So uh, with that, I will end because my timer is now saying that it ends. And that's the trick for presenters is to start your timer late. Thank you very much, Tony. And we all are on the same page with you. Together we are a team and we're all in this together. Thank you very much. Uh, before I uh, introduce the speakers, there are a few important things that I'd like to share with everybody. So once the speakers start presenting, it's going to take them about 10 minutes, seven to eight minutes for presentations, and we would request them to leave about two to three minutes for questions from new hires. Now for the new hires, in case you have any questions that you may want to ask of any speaker while they are presenting, so please type your queries into the chat box and uh, Claire Lazaro, she's going to be assisting us with answering those queries. 
time permitting, speakers would take up those queries after their presentation. Otherwise, we would also forward those questions to them. And you may also feel free to email them or contact them later on. So, and the another thing that I would just like to share here is, uh, I did send you an email with the details of the Starbucks gift card lucky draw. So in between, while we are having those presentations, just to add a little bit of fun and um, add some cheer and positivity to the day, we are going to be floating a few questions. So I'm going to be just sharing the rules with you as and when we reach there. Those are pretty simple questions uh, just to spread some positivity. And the clause is you need to answer in the chat box within five minutes. And the questions, the answers are not supposed to exceed beyond five words. So they have to be limited uh, between one word to five words. And I'm going to explain that as and when we arrive there. So I would like to introduce the first speaker of the day now. Hey, Jesse, Jesse, I'm sorry. I brought over Angela and Armel to introduce themselves. They didn't get a chance to real quick before we move on. That's okay. Yeah, we do have uh, about seven minutes. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, go ahead, Angela. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Angela Ramirez. I'm part of the Early Start team in Bedesto uh, with uh, Linda Barr. Um, I have been here since March, so a week before quarantine. Um, so far, I, I love it. I'm, I love what I'm doing. Um, I love the mission of VMRC. Um, I have a little bit of mental health background. I used to work at a SpearNet as a support counselor. Um, I used to work at the, Ch the Children's Crisis Center. Um, I used to be a behavior therapy, a behavior therapist. Um, and I'm also from the Central Coast. So I'm from the San Luis Obispo area. So I've only been here for about five years. So um, I'm adjusting as well. But um, it's really great to be on the on the team. So thank you all. Welcome. Doug, do we have any more people? Is it Armel? Go ahead, you're on mute, Armel. Armel, you're you're on mute. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> this is Armel. I'm the new CRA um, serving consumers of the VMRC. Um, I'm a lawyer and uh, I have a JD from Lewis and Clark University. I have a little bit of background working with people with disabilities. I worked for a USAID project in my country of origin, the Ivory Coast, where one of the component was to um, actually raise awareness about people with disabilities and the challenges that they face uh, in the legal system. So we did a lot of trainings with actors of the justice system. Um, so it's nice to meet you, to meet you all. Welcome. I think we got everybody, Jesse. Okay, all right. So I would like to introduce the first speaker of the day, the financial visit of Valley Mountain Regional Center, Claudia Reed. She's the financial, the chief financial officer of Valley Mountain Regional Center. Claudia has been with BMRC for a long time, and she would be speaking about the financial scope of the organization and other fiscal functions. So over to you, Claudia. Okay, thanks, Jesse. And welcome everyone. Um, I have found VMRC to be a, a good place to work. We have uh, friendly people. We have a dynamic uh, ED who keeps us all running. And um, you know, pretty much, uh, it's 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 nice here. Um, and the best thing is we have fantastic benefits. We really do. So. <laughs> um, I, I want to explain just a little bit about how the, the system is funded. As Tony mentioned, there's um, 21 of us, uh, different regional centers in the state. Every county is covered by one of those regional centers, uh, except Los Angeles, which has seven regional centers all to itself. So you can see where the population of California resides. It's in Los Angeles. So. Um, the rest of us, uh, our particular center, Valley Mountain, has five counties that, that we serve. They are San Joaquin, San Los, Amador, Calaveras, excuse me, and Tuolumne. 
Now, you know you've been in California a long time when you can pronounce Tuolumne uh, just by the way it looks. Um, it took me years. Um, I've been in California since 1974. Uh, came when I was 27 years old. So if, if you want to do the math, that turns out, yeah, I really am as old as I look. I'm 74 years old. And um, we'll be retiring probably within the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Not that that matters. Um, as, as Jesse said, I'm the chief financial officer. The system statewide uh, costs about six and a half billion dollars a year to the taxpayers of the state. So when you are doing your work, know that you're paying for part of it if you pay taxes. Um, we are almost entirely state funded. There is some federal money that the state um, gets um, primarily for the Early Start program, but the rest of it all comes from um, the state. So we're kind of beholden to the legislature and the budgeting process at the state. So uh, it's, a, it's a point of interest for all of us um, when, um, when it comes time for budgeting uh, each year, we, we watch that closely try to determine if we're going to get the same or more or less. Um, as you all know, it's been kind of a rough year um, worldwide. And um, I, I kind of expect that next year we may have less money to operate with than we do this year. Um, our funds uh, come to us in two separate pieces. One is called operations and one is called POS or purchase of service. Um, the POS is, is directly uh, funded, is directly for the funding of all the services that we do for our consumers. And the two funds do not mix. So um, we can't um, take operating funds and give it to POS and we can't take POS funds and, and, and supply our operations with it. Operations is um, the one thing that we have a bit of control over and, and therefore I, I watch it very carefully. Um, as you can imagine with being a service kind of industry, almost you know, 80% or more of our operating funds are salaries and benefits. Um, and we, we try to pay our employees as much as we possibly can, provide them with good benefits and still have to come within our uh, operating budget. Because the Lanaman Act doesn't guarantee that everyone that works for the center will be paid appropriately. It guarantees that everyone that has a disability will receive the services that they need. So it is it is up to us to uh, figure out how to make that work with our operating budget. And um, myself and Tony and the rest of the senior leadership team uh, work with that often during the year. We do at least a, a quarterly review of the budget and, and <clears throat> um, more at the beginning of the year when um, the new budget comes into play. My own staff, um, I'm, I'm responsible for several different pieces of, of um, things that go on. Um, the general ledger, you know, that's basic accounting stuff, which I know everyone loves. Um, you know, everyone wants to be an accountant, um, but um, that, that was a joke. I, I have, to, have to laugh occasionally. Um, but I, I do know that the only thing more boring than an accountant is an actuary. So we're not at the bottom of the list, but we're there close. Um, so um, just bear with me. Um, I have a, a general ledger person. In fact, I have two of them. Um, Melissa and Eric put together the uh, journal entries and the financial statements for me. They also do the state claim, which um, allows us to be reimbursed on a monthly basis for the services that we have provided. Um, I have an accounts payable person, just one, um, and she pays all the bills that are part of operations. Um, 
that being uh, the rent and the utilities and the supplies and uh, anything else that comes up under operations. I have a payroll person, someone that you know is near and dear to all of us. Um, she does a very good job, and I think you will find that you won't have very many mistakes on your check. And she's very responsible or responsive. If if you do find something wrong, feel free um, to email her. Um, I have a financial analyst who is near and dear to everyone's heart in case management because he does a lot of um, analysis and special project. Uh, you know, if someone wants to know, you know, how many of this particular service code did we do to people in the age of this to this, Larry can find that out for you. Um, he's he's very talented. He's a very smart man. Um, in fact, I kid him that I, I think he's the only one in the organization that I know for sure is smarter than me. Um, so um, <laughs> uh, he works for us. I also have a facilities director. I'm in charge of um, the facilities, all three sites. Uh, we have one here in Stockton, one in Modesto, and one in San Andreas, uh, different sizes. Um, uh, and D uh, Smith is my uh, facilities manager. She does an excellent job. She takes care of all the leaky faucets, all the uh, doors that don't open, and in this uh, time of COVID, all the temperature checking devices. And you know, she's just on it. And she also does a lot of um, remodeling work when that's necessary. She has contractors that she's affiliated with that are not affiliated with, but knowledgeable of um, that she can bring in and remove a wall here, put up a door there, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and then um, the largest part of my uh, staff is, is what we call the POS staff. And there are six people that work um, gathering together the invoices that all the case managers send us. They send us authorizations. We get invoices from the um, vendors. We match the two, make sure that everything is correct and um, pay the bills. We have six of those. I have a um, manager in charge of them. So that's the seventh person there. And then we have a dedicated um, OT, office technician, who does, you wouldn't believe how much microfilming, um, or I, I say that, you can tell how old I am when I say microfilm, microfishing, um, laser fishing, I'll get it right sooner or later, um, for our particular team. Um, she's dedicated to our team, she does a fantastic job, keeps things current. Uh, uh, the, the leader that uh, I mentioned, her name is Debbie Bayat. And um, all of you that are in case management will come to know Debbie pretty well. Um, she, she manages all of the, uh, the staff and, and the payments. We pay people, we pay our vendors in um, really kind of like four different uh, times. There is a, a um, uh, payment that goes out to people that have SSI, S SSP, that's always done on the third of the month or the business day prior to the third of the month, should it fall on a weekend. And that is a supplemental benefit that, uh, ben that uh, consumers get uh, because years ago their SSI and SSP was reduced and the uh, regional centers agreed to make up the difference. Uh, then on the 10th and the 15th, we pay the bulk of our vendors that supply services to all of our, our consumers. Um, and you know, the 10th uh, is our first check run. So if you are on the ball and get your invoices in on time and we have time to check them, you will get paid on the 10th. If you're a little bit more laid back and take longer to get them in, <clears throat> you'll be paid on the 15th. So there's some incentive there for our vendors to, to do their job as quickly as they can after the end of the month. 
Um, and then towards the end of the month, we pay a transportation uh, check run, which uh, is not that much since no one can be transported anymore um, due to COVID, but um, it will come back and it is a, a fairly substantial amount paying for all the transportation charges that um, our vendors or our consumers need during the month. So let's see, uh, what else do I need to tell you? Oh, I was going to tell you about the, and I, I did mention that our budget is split uh, into two, two different pots. Um, the POS side of things, we have a budget of about $254 million a year. That is a significant amount of money. Um, and in the operations, Side, we have $35 million um, to spend on mostly salaries and benefits and everything else that it takes to uh, keep the place running. Um, how am I Claudia, doing for time, Jesse? Got a, oh, I was going to say, Claudia, you got about two or three minutes if you, if you, anybody had any questions or. Yeah, um, that's fine. Um, if there are any questions for Claudia, feel free to enter them in the chat. Claudia is also a comedian, in case you guys didn't notice. Yeah, I'm a stand-up comic on the side. I, I wanted to be a torch singer, but I'm not that good. Some of you don't even know what a torch singer is, do you? <laughs> well, I, I, Question in the Q&A. Uh, okay. Claudia, there, Renato is asking, is that reserved for all regional centers or just VMRC? The vendors that I mentioned? Um, Maybe. Most of them are VMRC vendors. We do occasionally uh, need a vendor that we don't have, but one of the other regional centers does, and we can get a courtesy vendorization for that. But we have a whole department um, dedicated to taking care of, of our vendors and making sure we have the vendors that we, we need um, to serve our clients. That's headed up by um, a man named Doug yeah, Doug Bonet. No, I always get these two guys confused. Uh, <laughs> Brian Bennett is his name, um, and you'll you'll be hearing from him later. Uh, and that was that's what his job is. Okay, another question here. Hi, Miss Reed is from Ray Baggio. Is employment still stable with the VMRC budget for 2020-21? Uh, we believe so. Um, we are very hopeful, and we're being very careful this year not to. Um, bring on more staff than we think we can handle next year as far as the budget is concerned. Because one thing we do not want to do is um, put our staff in any kind of financial jeopardy. We've, we've been very lucky so far not to have to have any um, forced days off or anything like that or, or any layoffs. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty confident that that will happen again in the next year, um, that we will not have to uh, worry about that from a staffing point of view. Thanks Claudia, Ren question. sorry, Claudia Renato had a follow-up question. He actually meant the two hundred fifty million in funding. I'm sorry. When he asked about, again. he asked about the reserve for all regional centers or just VMRC. He was referring to the two hundred fifty. 245 million in funding. Um, yeah, the, the 254 million is our budget for our consumers. That is never in jeopardy. Um, it is a state law that Tony mentioned, the Lannerman Act, that, that gives people with developmental disabilities the right to, to have services. And the state does not and, and is not intending to. Um, reduce that funding. So uh, the consumers themselves will will be taken care of for sure. Thank you Anything very else? much. Thank you, Claudia. Very informative. We appreciate you taking out the time to be with us here this morning. Thank you. My pleasure. Welcome on board, everybody. Uh, the next speaker of the day is the most wanted person to optimize remote working during these challenging times. Uh, 
you guessed it right. Yes, it's Carlo Carticciori, the director of IT. And he would be sharing about the technology tools and services that could make your jobs easier and more productive. Over to Mr. Carlo Carticciori. Thank you so much, Jesse, and uh, welcome to all the new people here. Very excited to start seeing some of your faces. I know it's been a different experience for all of us uh, working remotely and, and meeting each other over Zoom. And I, I mean, I must say I'm pretty grateful at least we have a solution like Zoom to do this. So, you know, there, there is the silver linings there. So um, yeah, as, as uh, Jesse said, I am the director of IT here at Valley Mountain Regional Center. Uh, I have spent my career as a consultant in the Bay Area, helping companies move away from, you know, these older legacy systems, you know, companies just like VMRC that have had, that have been around for a while and, um, you know, have had different technology tools in place that were getting long in the tooth. And I have, I have helped these companies, you know, come up to date uh, and move them to solutions that, you know, you, we see that we see people using more often today to better collaborate, uh, better meet and uh, work remotely, and um, just have a simple, more streamlined experience. And so, you know, we were very fortunate at the beginning of, uh, you know, our shelter in place orders to get approval uh, to start using tools like Zoom and, um, you know, some of the remote phone systems. And so, you know, I'm here to try to get these, uh, these tools up and running. We have a lot of exciting plans coming up uh, over the next 12 months. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the, some of the new mobile devices that are being rolled out, the new laptops. We're going we're gonna to get new collaboration and chat features available, new file sharing features available, all things to make your job easier. You know, uh, our role in IT is not to have a fun time with technology. Our role is to help, you know, make you guys more productive and serve the employees. That, that is our number one priority. So you guys have probably met, uh, you know, most of my staff. Uh, Donna, Vera, and John Tunison are, are all on my staff. It's kind of a small, tight-knit team. And we all, we all collaborate on a lot of these projects we're working on. Uh, and help each other out as we get busy. And so you might see a, a, a big mix of us popping in and out. Um, and yeah, we're just really, we're really excited to help. I, I feel really great about the support that we've gotten from leadership. I know when I've talked to other regional centers that, you know, they don't always prioritize their technology the way uh, VMRC has. They've suffered over, you know, this past year as, as these issues came up and people had to work remotely. So, I mean, I feel, I feel like, you know, VMRC has made the right moves doing that and the employees have benefited and therefore the consumers have benefited because, you know, people have continued to uh, have access to, to work and, and communicate. And so I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited about the next year. I don't have too much more to say. I'm definitely happy to answer any questions and, and talk about, uh, you know, what, what we're doing to, to help everyone out. Do we have any questions for Carlo? I just see a comment from Renato. Thank you, Carlo. Doana has been fantastic in assisting me over the last couple of months, actually. He initially said yes, but it's months. Yeah, we, we get a lot of positive feedback uh, around Donna. I love hearing it. Um, she is a rock star employee. And I think it's been really cool, even since I first came on, uh, about a year ago to watch the whole team, you know, start learning more and, and taking on new things. And I think Donna has, has really excelled at that. They're asking if I will ever be back to the office. Um, I will definitely come back as soon as, as soon as, you know, we are able to start doing that more. Uh, it's been, a, a, once again, I'm really grateful that we have the tools in place to work remotely, uh, but it, there's, there's nothing um, that fixes seeing everyone's face in person. So soon enough. Any more? No other, no other questions in the chat or Q&A so far. Okay. Annabel appreciated that he's gonna be back. I think, I think um, one other thing to throw in uh, is that, 
is that we have another team uh, that is building applications for Valley Mountain Regional Center. You guys have probably heard about this. Uh, the, there's a company called Project Two that works pretty closely with Claudia and myself on, on these new tools that, that service coordinators are gonna start using. And so um, expect to, to start seeing new tools in place on these laptops over the next year where we've been doing pilots and um, are gonna start expanding those user groups. So hopefully, you know, those are the solutions that start making everyone's job easier and we are really excited to make those successful. I don't know if Claudia, you want you want to say anything else about that, um, but uh, I know I know we're excited to get that project really moving at high speed. Yeah, no, I, I don't have too much more to say. Um, the The organization's name is is Project Two. The leader's name is John Joyner. So if you hear those two uh, terms, uh, you'll know that those are the people that do the. Um, the special projects in, in the IT world uh, to build us software that um, is unique to us kind of and um, is designed around our needs. So uh, it's been very helpful. We have one project that's already rolled out that's called uh, SS. <laughs> um, and that, that is uh, working with uh, intake and scheduling. It's been a great help to them. And uh, we're working on getting an, another project that, to my chagrin, is called Atticus. I, I hate that name. Um, it means nothing except, you know, Atticus Finch from uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, or Atticus actually was a first century warrior. So, um, you know, what that has to do with us, I don't know. But. Um, uh, anyway, that's what they decided to call it, and it is designed for um, case managers to um, have have the ability to work remotely from um, from the site, actually. So as they are talking with people, they can be typing in their reports, getting them uh, signed if necessary, and all of it will sync up with the computer system. So it's kind of a step into the 21st century. So um, we're, we're happy to have that rolling out. I expect to have that piece finished by December 31st in Stockton and then move to the other two sites soon thereafter. Yeah, I think that'll be an exciting and a, and a big step forward for everyone. So we'll be watching that closely and, and helping out however we can in IT. Any other questions? Cool. Well, I'm excited to meet you, everyone here, uh, once we're back in the office and seeing each other more regularly. Jesse, you're on mute. Jesse, you're on mute. We didn't hear you. Thank you very much, Carlo. We appreciate you taking out the time from your busy schedule and presenting for all the new hires and being here this morning with us. Thank you very much. All right, so the next speaker that we have is none other than my very own supervisor, Mr. Badma Leeks, Director of Human Resources. As rightly said, it's easier to handle machines, but very difficult to deal with humans. This is the gentleman who does it with perfection. He needs no introduction from my side. So over to you, Bud. Thank you, Jesse. That was a, a great, great welcome. Uh, first of all, welcome to everybody. Love to see all the new hires. Uh, you probably know one of my staff already, and that's Mary Jane, since she does uh, most of the recruiting. So I just wanted to touch a little bit uh, with you this morning on human resources, because that's a, a term that people know, but don't always really understand what does it mean. So in our world, in the VMRC world, human resources basically means everybody. So our role is to keep VMRC legally safe and protected, make sure we're doing all the right things, uh, following the state and federal laws, filling out all the, all the reports, uh, all, all those types of aspects. In addition, is also taking care of understanding where is VMRC today, uh, lining up to the strategic plan, 
and how do we move um, the uh, regional center forward from a people side? And that's where uh, my team also gets involved. And under that is a whole bunch of other other stuffs. Uh, Doug, do you have my my uh, attachment? Are you able to share that? Yes, sorry, I got. No, no, no worries. I tracked. It's a Word document, Doug. Yes. So what I wanted to do was to just show you a little bit more of, uh, of my staff and, and our responsibilities and, uh, and what, we, what we take care of. So um, I have a small team as well. Uh, I have basically uh, four and a quarter uh, staff that work with me. Uh, the first one is Sarah. Uh, Sarah is basically responsible for all our records and benefits. Um, so this is working with CalPERS on, and on our benefit plans, um, on our retirement plans, um, and all the different reports that need to be to be filled out. Um, so that's her major focus is um, records and benefits. And as you can imagine, records is everything from employee files to um, uh, basically all the regulatory information, all records that, that we have. The other one to the right is Mary Jane which you've probably met and a big focus for her is basically on recruiting and new hire onboarding. Um, not to be confused with what we're doing today, which is new hire orientation. So the onboarding is when after you're hired, Mary Jane brings you in and helps you to fill out all your paperwork, your insurance forms, et cetera. And then um, the orientation is what we're doing today, which is really the big company overview. <clears throat> Mary Jane has been with uh, VMRC for a while and, um, and it does an excellent job. She also helps out with safety issues as well as workers comp. For me, um, I've been with VMRC going on four years now. Um, just started my fourth year. Uh, it's been Claudia hired me, and uh, it's been a it's been a quick three three plus years. I can tell you that for sure. I am also a San Jose uh, transplant up here into uh, I live in Lodi, and um, just so uh, you know, I'm a little bit older than most of you. Okay, maybe a lot. Um, and we moved for the same reason most of you did, and that's that uh, we weren't able to ever get enough money to buy a house. So that's a little bit about my background. For me, I manage the department, but also I'm very involved with working with the union, um, working with uh, Jesse on, on the training aspects. I'm also responsible for safety and security oversight as well. Um, and uh, so I certainly have plenty to, to keep me busy. Myra is one of the newer ones to the team and she's very much our systems person. Um, again, with all the different documents and stuff, they have to get on systems. Little things that you might be interested in. She's the one that puts the information in so you get paid. So you, you wanna be nice to two people, Myra and Elizabeth. Myra puts your information in to get paid, Elizabeth pays you. So as long as you're kind to those two, you'll always be paid and happy. And uh, so very, very excited uh, to have her to assist me and, and, and the department. And then, the last two is um, uh, is Christine Adams, who works part time uh, helping out the HR department. Uh, she's been great, um, and um, 
we appreciate her help. She also helps out Fisco. So she's been a real attribute. Wish we could keep her full time, but she also helps out Brian Bennett and he's not willing to, to let her go. So we got to share. And then of course, Jesse and Jesse's the brand new uh, addition to the team. Uh, she's got a great uh, training and instructional design background. Uh, we're thrilled to have her in HR. She's doing an excellent job as you've seen today. And uh, she's a real attribute to, to the department. And that's really all I have. I wanna give her a couple extra minutes for those uh, that go over. <laughs> Welcome you, everyone. Thank you, bud. Uh, do we have any questions for bud? I don't see any so far. All right. Thank you, bud. So we're going to move to a little exciting kind of a phase. Now comes the time to share the first question for the Starbucks Lucky Draw. So the instructions were sent to you, but just to briefly refresh everybody's memory, the question would appear in the chat. All that you need to do is answer on the chat here within five minutes. And the responses should not be more than five words long. A and B, I, they are all going to be counted as one word. So make sure that your response does not exceed the five word limit. If it's more than that, we would not be able to consider you in the pool for the lucky draw. Doug, could we request you for the first question to be please put into the chat section? Yep, just post it in chat. Okay, all right, so your time starts now and you have five minutes to do this. You could take a break to go to the restroom, get a drink for yourself, and we're gonna have the next speaker, that's Cindy Stradman at 10.30. Cindy, am I doing your, am I controlling your presentation? I can go ahead and do it. Okay, okay. I'm just giving everybody some time to punch in their responses. Claire, Claire, you're going to be able to do yours as well. Oh, yeah. You'll share yours, Claire? Okay. And this is something which is open to the new hires as well as the speakers. The class remains the same. You have to punch in your answers within the five minute time limit, and it is not to exceed the five word limit. And we would be announcing the winners after about 10 days because we would need some time to put all the names in, you know, into the lucky draw pool and then take out the names. All right, so while you are punching in your answers, it's time for me to introduce the next speaker so the next speaker of the day is someone who does a work with utmost diligence and ensures that we are in compliance. So it's not another other than Cindy Stradaman. So please welcome Cindy Stradaman, the sub support staff manager at Valley Mountain Regional Center. Over to you, Cindy. Everybody, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I'm Cindy Stradaman, and I'm one of the six administrative assistants here at Valley Mountain Regional Center. Um, brief history, I was born and raised in Oroville, California, which we've been in the news a lot lately. Um, I've been in Stockton for about 40 years, so don't do the math. Um, I've been with VMRC about seven years. I'm the administrative assistant for Cindy Mix and also the, um, the HIPAA compliance manager. I manage the case management staff in Stockton, Modesto, and San Andreas. I come from about 30 years in banking. I started out as a teller, a vault teller, um, manager, and lastly, I was a program coordinator or project coordinator. And I just wanna share that Valley Mountain is the best place to work. So um, 
Tony only gave me a few minutes, so I was only able to put together like a 30 page PowerPoint presentation. Um, so I'll try to talk really fast and kind of get into my allotted time. I'm just kidding. So let me share my screen with you guys. Okay, Doug, I'm having technical difficulties. Can you share it for me? Uh, yeah, give me. Sorry about give, that. Give me two seconds. Um, go ahead and unshare or stop share. Oh, wait, I got it. I got it. I got it. Sorry about that. There I am. I have two monitors. And I was like on the wrong one. So, um, I want, like I said, I'm one of the five, actually six as of yesterday. I am one of six um, administrative assistants here at Valley Mountain Regional Center. And I just wanted to share with you today kind of um, what we do. Um, and like this puzzle, we are um, the glue that kind of holds Valley Mountain Regional Center together. So don't let these other part departments kid you. Um, our administrative staff are the most awesome staff that you're going to be able to work with. Um, so without us, you really wouldn't be able to put it together. So I'm one of the six, and together we manage support staff of over 30 office technicians, senior office technicians. Um, together we're all here to support the various departments from clinical, case management, fiscal, and resource development. And we're actually here just to make you guys look good. Um, and there's, like I said, six of us. There's myself, Christy Lopez, um, our newest, Vicki Fisher, Karina Ramirez. We have Heaven Richardson and Janet, Jan Maloney. So what does the support staff do for you? Well, we're here to provide assistance from printing, mailing documents, filing in our electronic filing system, even some technical assistance for our intake and service coordinators, um, and also for program managers. So whatever work that you produce, we're the ones that take care of it after you're done with it. Um, one of my other duties, and probably my favorite, is I'm the HIPAA Compliance Officer, and I provide annual training, technical support, and breach reporting for, for HIPAA compliance here at Valley Mountain. We take confidentiality, confidentiality and protecting privacy seriously here at Valley Mountain. We may not be a medical facility or mental health facility, but we handle those daily, those records daily in serving our consumers. Beside being the law, we want to ensure confidence that we are protecting all that information that we receive and use. I look forward to you attending one of my HIPAA trainings. And I just want to give you one big tip for today. I want to make sure that you use a very strong password. That's the best tip that I can give you for today. So that's it. Welcome to Valley Mountain Re uh, Regional Center. The support staff and I really look forward to working with you. And that's it for me. Right. Thank you very much, Cindy. That was really informative. Do we have any questions for Cindy Stradaman? I don't have any so far in the chat or Q&A. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Cindy, for taking out the time to be with us here and present. Thank you. So the next speaker we have is a very important pillar of Valley Mountain Regional Center, very graceful and knowledgeable. It is none other than Cindy Mix, the Director of Consumer Services. She would be sharing an overview of case management with us. Over to Cindy Mix. Okay, thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Cindy. Uh, Cindy Mix, uh, Director of Consumer Services. My position oversees the case management department um, that serves our Lanterman consumers, ages three and up. You will learn all about the Lanterman Act um, very soon. It is the law that guides us in our work. Uh, 
These are the positions that make up the case management department. Our agency is driven by service coordination, uh, so all other VMRC staff are supports to case management to ensure needed services are provided to consumers. Identifying needs with the consumer and their circle of support and providing services to meet those needs is our number one priority. Program managers help by leading a team, helping problem solve cases and monitor timelines and their work. And then you can see all of the other positions that we have in case management as well. We have 180 service coordinators, um, 22 senior service coordinators, 18 program managers, one project manager, one cultural specialist, uh, three administrative assistants, 20 SOTs, and 10 office techs. So it makes up quite a, a large uh, number. Our core case management staff um, is uh, made up of 18 teams. We have three offices, one uh, Stockton, one Modesto, and one in San Andreas. And you can see the different teams that, that we do have. We've got seven children's teams, a new adolescent team. We have two transition age teams, six adult, one deflection, and one self-determination team, which is fairly new as well. And you'll be learning a lot more about self-determination very soon. So the uh, caseload composition and those teams we were talking about, the children's teams, um, they, they serve those who are ages 3 to 15. Uh, adolescent team, which is a new team for VMRC, that serves ages 13 to 16 in the, in the Stockton office only at this time. Uh, our transition team, uh, they serve ages 15 to 23 and then adult ages 23 and up. And then the deflection team handles those cases that are criminally involved uh, or challenging cases. The primary uh, duties of a service coordinator include all of these items. Um, they meet face-to-face -face at least annually with the consumers and their circle of support. Um, they facilitate the planning team meetings. They develop the IPP, which is a legal document, and they develop that with a planning team. And that is the highest priority for us, ensuring the development of that consumer's uh, individual program plan. We call it the IPP. We will review the basic components in a minute, um, but we also follow a case currency standard. We meet with the consumer uh, in their birth month for the IPP and the annual review. We update the CEDAR. That's reviewing the uh, status of the skill level and capabilities. Uh, we generate at least 400 units of Title 19 documentation per month. Those are ID notes uh, based on the contacts with the consumer uh, in 15 minute time increments. And we ensure the reports are finalized by the 15th of the month following uh, the meeting being held. We have a tracking mechanism in place that generates a report showing all contacts and reports needed in uh, any given month. The data is entered electronically uh, as the documentation occurs and we have a clear picture of the currency status from that point. And then you see the other items listed. We have a lot of other contacts, the I IPP and annual review that we talked about. We have qu quarterly reviews for those who are residing in residential facilities or uh, are receiving supported living services. And then we have sem semi-annual telephone contact at the very least, and then any meetings that are issue driven. So that's a lot of meetings in a year for someone. Um, what does a service coordinator do? And 
from this slide, you can tell there is so much that is um, that is needed from a service coordinator. They need to be knowledgeable of the services. They have to have a lot of various uh, skill attributes um, in many, many areas while hand handling a pretty high caseload. Um, it is truly a juggling act sometimes. Um, but you, the service coordinator needs to be the all-knowing person um, when dealing with uh, consumers. And the caseloads by law uh, should vary between 62 and 66, depending on the circumstances. However, our ratios average currently uh, one service coordinator to about 85 consumers agency-wide. Um, but you can see from this example here, all of the skills and attributes necessary along with the knowledge. And um, it's pretty, it's pretty um, telling of exactly what the, the job entails. You need to have a lot of knowledge about uh, all of the different systems, um, all of the different services, but you also um, need to be a good listener. You need to be a mentor. You need to be a great communicator, um, all of those things, along with the knowledge of all of the regulations that are required. So it's a pretty all encompassing job. Uh, and this just gives you a quick overview of who we serve by diagnosis. 37% um, of our consumers um, have an intellectual disability. 34% um, are diagnosed with autism, 12% epilepsy or seizure disorder, 9% uh, cerebral palsy, and then another 5% um, severe profound intellectual disability. And then this is who we serve age and gender wise. We have 64% male and 36% of our population are female. And um, we've got some trends that we're looking at right now. Uh, the zero to two years of age, 15% of our population. Uh, three to five years of age, 12%. Six to 21 years of age, 35%. Uh, 22 years of age to 51 years of age, 29%, and then 9% makes up 52 plus years. And the trend is toward the, the younger. As you can tell, we have more children's teams right now than we do adult, and, and that's reflective of our population. And then I wanna go over the importance of the IPP, which is our main document, um, that's the contract between the regional center and the consumer. Uh, it keeps a record of all of those planning team decisions that are made when you meet with that consumer and the services decided upon. It has to be individualized. It's customized to that person. And we, um, we use the person-centered approach and have those goals. We look at what's important to a person, what's important for that person, and that helps guide us. And we try to look at things in a very positive manner to see what, what is so important to that consumer and what might, might help them uh, guide them through their lives. And then um, another important aspect of the IPP, the providers, um, receive their, the expectations through that IPP. So we let them know the service that we expect from them. And then of course, the case management offers that coordination and continuity um, based on the IPP. And then the IPP also justifies the use of expenditures. So we let everyone know who is responsible for funding that particular service. It might be the regional center, it might be the school district, it might be a generic resource uh, community option. So all of that is documented in that uh, individual program plan. And then, like I mentioned, we do the person, we use the person-centered approach. 
Um, and this is a direct conversation with the consumer. Uh, that consumer speaks on their own behalf. We always get agreement from the consumer before going forward with any service. And we also encourage um, the consumer to bring along uh, to any meeting or have, have their circle of support involved when uh, any decisions are being made. We encourage family involvement or um, other persons in that uh, individual's life to be involved in decisions, but it is always the consumer's final decision. And then we focus on the positive. We try to look at what's, what's good in that person's life and what we can build upon. And like I mentioned before, we look at what is important to that consumer and then what the needs are and what's important for the consumer. And we try to conduct our assessments in natural environments so we get a better idea of their life. And then we always look at these these items, these different categories when developing an individual program plan. Of course, we have to look at the needs. That's important for the consumer. We look at their choices. That's what's important to the consumer. And we also look at their culture, their lifestyle and capabilities. And all of those items together will help make up that IPP and all those services um, for the consumer. And then we look at considerations um, for services in that IPP. We always pursue generic resources before accessing the regional center funds. The regional center is considered the payer of last resort. And so we, we always look to community and uh, generic resources first. We ensure that community service providers offer good quality services for a fair price. So we look at the, the least costly, but can meet the needs. And all things being equal, uh, we will go with that least costly vendor. Effective use of public funds clinically and fiscally, that's something else we always need to take a, uh, into consideration. We always have to look at the health and safety impact on the individual when considering services. And then the services are required to be a direct result of their diagnosis that made them eligible for regional center services. And I wanted to just show you a quick example of our personal profile um, sheet that we complete now for every consumer uh, it chronicles the positive things in their life and what is important to them. And you can see this person wants to avoid loud noises. So that's important to them. They don't want to be around loud noises. Um, but the most important people in their, in their life, their family, what their hobbies are. This person wants to work at Taco Bell someday. They love going to the Roseville Mall. So this gives you a, a quick snapshot of the person. And we found these to be um, important to the consumers and um, to the families. They, they really do enjoy working with the service coordinator to develop their personal profiles. And then lastly, I wanted to just show you uh, some examples of services um, that we access. This gives you a, um, snapshot of, of some of the services that we provide. Sometimes we need to get uh, creative. We've got a lot of vendors. You'll, you'll be hearing a lot about that from our resource development department. Um, when we find that there is a need, we identify that need. We let our resource development department know that, um, that we have that need. We need a service to be provided in order to meet the needs of that consumer. And so we have a lot of vendors in, uh, with these various categories and we can access these services for our consumers. And these, this is just a, a small sampling. 
but some pretty major categories. So that's a quick overview of case management. I hope I didn't go over my time allotted. Um, are there any questions? There, is there anything in the chat? I, I don't see anything in the chat so far and in the Q&A. And Cindy, you didn't go beyond the time limit. In fact, we are a little early for that matter. Oh, okay. I was trying to talk fast. <laughs> yeah, we started a little early, yes. <laughs> so I just want to welcome everyone. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy working at Valley Mountain Regional Center. I've been here 24 years myself, uh, so I apparently I enjoy it. So welcome to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, here we're going to take a short break. I think everybody needs a short break. Maybe people need to go to the restrooms, get a shower, you know, a drink for themselves, and just stop looking at the screen. So we're going to be meeting again at 11 o'clock. So it's 10:52, uh, and we're going to be back at 11 a.m. And the next person who's going to be presenting is Claire Lazaro. So see you in the next eight minutes. And you can stay on here if you want. If you want to take a break, just go ahead, walk a little bit around and be back. So see you at 11 again.
Tara, I have your presentation. Um, when you're up, do you want me to share it or are you going to share it from yours? Whatever you'd like. Can, can you share it? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Welcome back from the break. I hope you had a good break, although it was a short one. So the next person coming up, the next presenter is someone who's an extremely significant role player, and I would rather let her explain what she does. In fact, in this event, she's assisting me with responding the queries of new hires and has an expansion of almost all the acronyms. So if there are any acronyms used during this entire event and you want to know what's the expansion for that, please feel free to ask Claire Lazaro. So she is the person who would be able to give you all the details of what the acronyms stand for. So please welcome the Director of Clinical Services, Claire Rosero, who's going to be our next speaker. Over to you, Claire. Thank you, Jesse. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our training orientation. So I'm here to tell you more about our clinical services at VMRC. Um, there you go. So I was tasked to answer these two questions. What does the clinical director do and what are the services of the clinical department? Um, so being in the clinical department, um, they, I decided I'm going to be giving you this kind of like organizational map to see what is what comprises the whole clinical services. So um, I basically supervise our licensed professionals. We do have physicians, nurses, psychologists, um, dental coordinator, dental hygiene. She is a dental hygienist as well. We have a dental consultant. We have another consultant pharmacist. And soon we are about to have a BCBA. Um, directly, I supervise Tara, our assistant director of clinical services, which you will meet in a little bit. And also, we do have administrative assistants as well. So Tara directly um, manages and supervises the intake department, the early start, and also the clinical coordinators. And we do have the coordinator for autism services, the clinical projects coordinators. We have an education specialist. And soon, um, we're hoping to have the intake specialist. Um, pending This is pending board approval. Um, we do have, as of now, a senior intake um, coordinator. But uh, pending board approval, we're hoping to have um, a clinical uh, intake specialist. And then we do have clinical administrative assistants that um, supervise our office technicians in all our offices. And we do have clinics such as the telemedicine, telepsychiatry, which I'm sure some of you have already sent some referrals. We have our PT gate clinic, our OT sensory clinic, we, they also do some DME home modifications, AAC. In the process right now, we are doing, in the process of organizing our remote oral health support clinic. So we actually started with a grant supposed to have for a virtual dental home. Um, we were already in the process of organizing that and then COVID hit. And then, so we decided during this time, instead of pushing through with the virtual dental home for now, we're gonna do the remote oral health clinic to support our consumers while they are in their um, own care care home. So the, the goal is to find a, a care home. We're gonna pilot this with a care home or, and we're gonna send a an intraoral camera that will look into their mouth um, with the help of their direct support professional. Of course, we're gonna give some training we're going to have um, pre and post evaluation, and then we're, we will have um, Carissa to be in the other end. Carissa is our dental coordinator in the other end of the video to look, to, to look and see what's happening and give real time dental teaching, oral health um, screening, and education to our consumers. So, this is basically the general gist of what the clinical department is and what I do for most part. Um, I did not give you a background on myself. So going back to that, I am actually first and foremost a parent, 
And that's how I got involved. I have two children who you probably are hearing one of them in the background uh, doing dental, uh, distance learning. So I do, I do have two children who are consumers of the original center, a girl and a boy. Both of them have autism. So they have underwent through um, the screening process. I went through all of those as a parent from referral to intake, um, the screening and the assessment and then getting services, going to IEPs, transition IEP, my first IEP and all that. Um, they were fortunate to be able to be given um, the EIBT at that time, Early Intervention Behavioral Therapy Program that we have. It's a collaboration with our school districts. At that time, there we didn't have the um, um, SB 946, I think was the number, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that is the insurance law where the insurance will cover ABA therapy. So at that time, we didn't have that. And so we were fortunate enough. And we actually fought for that. <laughs> it was a really good um, team effort with the IEP team um, to get that service for my children. Um, so they're doing well right now. So that's firstly how I got involved with the regional center. I've been here working as a staff for over a year now. Um, but before that, I have been involved as one of the board members. Um, so I've been more, almost seven years a volunteer board member. I've worked with other committees, Consumer Services Committee, um, Executive Committee as the Vice President, um, Review and Nominating Committee. I've worked with the previous Strategic Planning Committee of the Regional Center as well. Um, so that's for that. Um, oh, and then I do have a medical background. I am a physician in the Philippines. I didn't pursue residency here, although I passed all the tests already um, because that was actually the time when my kids were diagnosed and I decided to focus my time and attention to them. Um, and then eventually I decided to go into nursing and so now I am a nurse practitioner. Um, this is basically a gist of what, a summary of what I focus on as a clinical director. I work collaboratively with our clinical nurse manager, Angela Jurge, in helping, um, in, we, we call this more of a clinical advocacy because we really advocate for our consumers who doesn't have the ability to um, decide on their own and give informed consent and they don't have power of attorney, they don't have family, they're not conserved. So we want to advocate for them. Um, so this is a summary of that process. We work also in collaboration with a, with a service coordinator and with a program manager. Some of you I may have had palliative care meetings with as well. Um, the limit of that, well, it's not really a limit, but the expansion of that would be when it is about changing code status and deciding into hospice care. I do involve our executive director, Tony, so I do expand to involving him into that, um, into that team when it goes um, into, that, into those sensitive matters. Um, so this is an overview of what clinical services does. I mentioned about having our nurses, um, uh, eligibility process, intake, early start, OTPT, dental. Um, this is, I have all these other data in this presentation to, to give to you, which I think um, Jesse might be able to use in other detailed orientation but I'm just presenting it here to give you guys an idea. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of the, all of the PowerPoints in the interest of time. Um, this is the last thing that I wanted to show you is the eligibility process, which I'm sure you guys know as well. I always wanna reiterate and emphasize to people that parents can self-refer uh, Self-advocates can self-refer to VMRC because um, most people think they have to be referred by their physicians. Um, so that is what one of those we can call a myth. <laughs> I know for a fact that we can self-refer because I did self-refer. The physician, the pediatrician who was seeing my kids actually gave me the number and she asked me to call and not her to call. So that's how I know that we can self-refer. Um, and with that, I'm going to be accepting questions.
I'll have to stop sharing this first. There you go. Um, okay. Thank you, Tony, for helping me with all these. Because <laughs> I wasn't able to <laughs> write them there. Yep. DME, IEP, AAC, OTPT. Thank you so much. I don't see any other questions. Oh, wait. Ray, Ray said he has a question. Where's Ray? Ray, are you in one? Are you one of those phone numbers, Ray? Oh, will you all oh, return to the office in 2021? <laughs> we are taking that. Um, we very cautiously, Ray. Similar to how the state is doing things very cautiously, we are taking that very cautiously as well. We are looking out and watching for whatever guidance we will get from the state and local ordinances and public health. And based on that, we do adjust our decisions based on those guidance that we get from them and as well as CDC. So I cannot for sure say that we are, yes, all going to be going back, but the goal is eventually when it is safe for all of us to go back is, yes, for us to go back when it is safe for us to do that. It's Day. Somebody is excited behind me. <laughs> Walang anuman, Mr. Ray. He's right. saying thank you in Tagalog. Uh, thank you, Claire. You're welcome. Uh, do we have any more questions or else we have the next speaker lined up because we've already reached the time limit. So thank you very much, Claire. That was really very informative. And thank you very much for taking care of all the answers that you're giving in the chat section. And yes, even for Tony, who took up the role while you were speaking. So the next speaker on the list uh, uh, is Tara Sizemore Hester, Assistant Director, Early Start and Intake Services. Tara has been with VMRC for a very long time and has handled a wide variety of portfolios. She comes with a sea of knowledge that we all can use to learn a lot. So over to you, Tara. Hi, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, I'm just gonna, I, I have been here a long time. I've been here over 30 years. I started as, as a service coordinator in the Modesto office and then um, senior service coordinator in Stockton for San Joaquin County. Um, I'm going to talk about some positions and I've held some of these positions um, after I was senior service coordinator I was the education specialist for the entire office um, for all offices um, in five counties and then I, I moved on to coordinator of autism services um, and then program manager at our San Andreas office so I um, oversaw services at um, for San Andreas of for three counties. Um, and then now since June of 2019, I've been the assistant Cl clinical director working under Claire. Um, and I've loved every job I've had. So I, um, at the end, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. Okay, Doug. But the two biggest departments that I oversee are early start and intake. And they're fairly large um, services in, in our area. Claire talked a little bit about intake and eligibility. Uh, basically, I have two intake managers that work under me, um, and then um, from one for Modesto, one for Stockton, and then in San Andreas, I actually manage intake for that um, office. Uh, intake's a very important vital service. It's the first time that a family um, gets to see us that they interact with us and we really want to make um, the first impression for families and consumers, um, prospective con consumers, to be the best, you know, that we're the, the face of the agency, the first face. And then the, uh, probably the, most lar the largest area that I oversee is early start services. And those services are for children um, age zero to age uh, three when they go into the, the over three service um, provision. Uh, early start services um, folk has a focus on early intervention, and that's an area that's um, vital, um, in my opinion, and there's research actually to support that. Uh, we have three early start managers, um, two in Stockton, um, 
one in Modesto, and then one of the Stockton managers supervises Early Start in San Andreas. And so the focus of our Early Start services is to um, provide parent coaching and to meet with families um, from the beginning and to kind of guide them through this journey. It's, you know, it's a difficult um, time for families. They're learning that their child um, is at risk for a developmental disability. They may have already be diagnosed with a de developmental disability. There's a lot of grief going on. And so basically our service coordinators in Early Start are there to support the family step by step so that they feel that um, they can navigate this new normal um, on their own at some point. Uh, we provide through Early Start services, um, we're kind of the education agency in Early Start. So we provide, um, along with the parent coaching, some for children at risk for autism. We provide ABA services. Uh, we provide speech services, OT, um, developmental um, services for the children and, and in the natural environment in the home. However, if there is um, um, an extenuating circumstance or if the needs of the child and the family, because we're, it's family focused in early start, if those needs can be met um, um, more proficiently in another environment, let's say it's an ABA program, we do Primarily those are in home, but in some cases we do some center-based as the child turns, gets closer to three. And I know Jesse, um, my early start team and I put together a, a training for you on early start. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but it is an extre extremely large department um, and, and is, is my love. Uh, behavioral services um, is another area that I oversee. Uh, you're gonna hear more about that if you haven't already. Um, from Melissa Claypool, um, as she basically oversees our, our behavioral services, our BIS department, behavior intervention services. Uh, she also is part of our diagnostic services. So I supervise um, Melissa Claypool, who, who's our coordinator of autism services. She, one of her large roles is to um, screen, assist in screening and um, um, referral for diagnostics for children uh, or adults that may be, um, there's this, you know, a, we suspect that autism um, may be um, an issue with them or, or diagnosis may be in, in line and we want to really, you know, look at the needs of the child. So although we provide services, autism services for children at risk, we also um, look at diagnostic services. So, and Melissa's busy every day as you know looking at that area education services we were lucky enough to get an education specialist this year after not having one for several years uh, that's olivia held um, she basically is there to support our staff to support families um, to be a liaison to the selpas the special education local plan areas in all five counties to liaison to school districts and um, um, this is a vital uh, service, I believe, for our families, especially um, because they, that is another area, the education um, area, the IEP process is something else that families need to learn to navigate. So we have her support for that. She also oversees our, our early start um, um, autism um, services for children at risk or diagnosed. So she has a big job too. Uh, the other piece that I, I um, oversee is a clinical coordination. So we have a couple of um, um, staff, uh, Juanita Lazar and, and um, Brittany Coleman, who oversee our OT, occupational therapy clinics, our PT, um, physical therapy. Um, our, we have a gate clinic um, and they oversee those services and also um, home modifications. Um, durable medical equipment. So they also have, have a huge job. And so I oversee um, those services. Um, and then I already talked a little bit about San Andreas intake. And um, so I, I manage that piece. 
my background, I already touched on it, um, but I have been um, in the in the regional center system for a long time. I love this job. I've loved, like I said, every job that I've had uh, at Valley Mountain Regional Center. When I started here in my right after college, I my basically was going to work. My goal was to work at VMRC for two years, and then I was going to you know figure out what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Here I am, over 30 years later. Uh, I Every job I had at VMRC has been my joy. Um, when I talk about what is my why, why do I do this? I do this for the children. I um, do it for our families and for our consumers. Um, I just have to give a shout out to, to Dr. Howard Cohen. He was my mentor. He was our, our clinical director. He passed away in 2007. Um, Claire actually reminds me of him. Um, it's, he would have loved Claire. So basically he developed a, a collaborative program to oversee um, autism services in collaboration with the school districts and the SELPAs. We were nationally and still are nationally recognized for our services, our autism services. I, I um, worked in our, we used to have a diagnostic clinic and I worked under Dr. Cohen, Dr. Cohen in that diagnostic clinic um, so that we could, could support families and work with the school districts um, so that, that families and children can um, receive early intervention and, and have the support that they need. So my why, I've always, like I said, loved this job, but my why is the outcomes for, for the, the children and adults and our families um, to assist them um, as much as possible. And this is a picture of me and Dean. Dean actually went through, who's diagnosed in our, um, years ago, went through our autism clinic. And he is um, um, now in high school. He's applying to, to colleges. He's at the top of his class. His, um, a little boy that at age four that came through our, our autism clinic and he couldn't talk. I still remember the first meeting with his mother. She um, was sobbing the entire time and um, we all worked together with the support of intake and his service coordinator and, and um, Dean is who he, asked, who he is today. And, and um, so that, that is what my why is. I would encourage all of you to, to look at what your why is, even if you're brand new here, you know, start looking for that why, because I think, um, if, if your career here is anything like most of ours, um, we're a family and, and we love our jobs. Thank you. But any questions? I don't see any questions so far. There is a question now, sorry. Um, from ACE, her department social services to send out CCL to send out a notification to preschools, child care providers that there has been a decline in early start referrals since the pandemic. Is there anything VMRC is doing to ensure infants and toddlers are still getting referred for early intervention during this time? Yes, we sure are. We have a, a um, outreach committee that was developed. Um, they are um, working on um, outreach through public out publicity, working with physicians, um, and we have a team put together. Family Resource Network uh, is also on that team. We have our cultural specialists on that team, so um, we can reach um, you know fam those families that are um, um, having difficulty reaching out, and we also have um, Doug. Um, on our committee. So uh, we have a huge outreach. Tony and I are both on a, the state early start council. And so um, we put a, a huge focus on that. And referrals are actually picking up in Modesto. Right now, um, our issue is primarily San Joaquin County. All right, thank you very much, Tara. We would not be able to take any more questions at this point, but we would send it further and then we would be able to get the responses later on because we have the next speaker lined up and we need to respect everybody's time. Thank Excellent. you, Tara. That was really informative. We appreciate that. 
so the next speaker on the list is um, supposed to be Brian Bennett, but due to some reasons, some unavoidable, um, uh, you know, personal uh, reasons, he, he's not able to join us. But we do have Robert Fernandez, who's going to be presenting in lieu of Brian Bennett. And Robert is also supposed to be presenting his own segment later on at 11.50. So Robert, we would request you to present here the segment that Brian was supposed to be presenting. So over to Robert. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Um, it's good to be here. Good morning. I know things have changed a little bit um, with COVID. Well, a lot of bit, I guess, if that's a word, but um, glad everyone is here. Glad that uh, you decide to join VMRC as a team. Um, like Jesse said, unfortunately, Brian is not able to um, do this presentation. And so uh, I'm here. I am Robert Fernandez, a community services manager directly under Brian. Um, as part of the resource development team. So my, uh, my topic is how we build and sustain regional network and or just resources in general. Um, our department resource development, our responsibility is to develop, develop resources for VMRC. Uh, you're talking about residential facilities, um, SLS programs, day programs, uh, even in the clinical part, you know, where Jason Tape was the program manager for that, developing clinical services, uh, in-home respite, um, you know, personal assistance, any vendorization goes through resource development. And so that's, that's our department, that's uh, the department that Brian oversees. Um, I'm just going to touch on a few things because obviously, you know, time is, is limited, but I'm going to touch on how we build and how we sustain these, these resources. Uh, one of the things that we do is through what we call regular development. And regular development is just someone contacts us and say, hey, I would like to, let's just say, open up a residential uh, care home, you know, a, a care home, uh, another term that's used uh, common out there in the community. I want to open up a care home. What we direct them to do is um, uh, submit a, a letter of intent, an LOI. As you can see, it's LOI process. We review that LOI, we check for references, we check for experience, uh, and we ask a few other questions to determine whether or not, um, you know, they can be, they can take the next step in developing that project. So there's that LOI process, letter of intent process. Um, when I put, as you can see there, when I say there's no money attached, I'll talk about how development of a project can have monies or grants uh, attached to it. But in this case, through regular development, there are no monies attached to it. Funding is the sole responsibility of the proposed provider or the potential provider, okay? So that's regular development. Uh, request for proposal or RFP, that there's, this is another way that we um, build uh, resources uh, for VMRC. Um, and I talked about early in a previous slide as far as monies attached through the CPP community placement uh, program or plan, excuse me, uh, monies is attached. So let's just say there's $100,000 uh, to develop. We'll put an RFP out there that says, hey, we would like to provide services to this specific population, uh, all females with autism. And so we will put out an RFP, a request for proposal out to the community. The community in general will um, submit an RFP, an application, we review, we interview, and then we decide and pick uh, who we think who, who we think is the best um, uh, option to provide that services. Therefore, that 100,000 is granted to them. Okay, so there's money attached through the CPP process. Um, there is an obligation to provide specific services, like I said, and that's done through the, uh, as outlined by the RFP. Okay, and I gave an example as far as, you know, an all female, uh, who have autism. Uh, so it could be very specific that way, okay? There's also a process that doesn't involve CPP, but it's a non-grant process. We'll put out an RFP, again, out to the community, but there are, there's no monies attached to that, okay? It's just a general, we need a specific home in the mountain county, uh, excuse me, in the, uh, in the foothills or the mountain counties, uh, but unfortunately, there's no monies attached to that. However, again, the obligation is to provide specific services as outlined by the RFP. So that's the request for proposal, how we build network. We also build network and maintain networks uh, through vendor training. So existing 
providers we provide trainings for and also new providers or, or vendors we provide training for. That's done through residential services orientation or RSO. That's done through day program orientation or DP. And then we have these uh, supported living services and independent living services uh, orientations, okay? So we provide trainings to new vendors and existing vendors. Uh, that's how we build and also sustain uh, providers. Another way we um, develop providers uh, and or our network is that we have an unmet, unmet needs process, okay? We build it based on need. How do we know there's a need out there? Well, you typically a service coordinator will uh, request this need that you have that's specific to maybe your consumer, okay? Uh, you would have a discussion with your PM or your serv uh, senior service coordinator um, and you would submit to resource development an email stating that, hey, you have this particular need because there aren't any in that, uh, uh, in that area. Uh, for example, we have limited resources, as Tara and or, you know, um, uh, can attest limited resources up in the foothills, right? So uh, we always get a lot of requests for the foothills as far as resources. And so you as a service coordinator would submit this uh, unmet need to our department and and we hope we hope but we work very hard to develop those resources as much as possible um, like i said you'll send a request to the unmet needs process and that's done through via uh, inside exchange um, those who are on the team includes brian myself jason paul and jessica so that's part of the small resource development team Any questions? My kids in the background are raising their hand, but I can't, can't call uh, them down. <laughs> of course, Ray does. I don't, let me see, I don't see the question. I think he's still typing the question. Okay, okay, Robert, is it okay yes. if you come back with the questions, you know, once you present your next segment, because we already have Nicole Weiss and Nidra Clayton there, you know, waiting. Because... Absolutely. Okay, thank you're, you very much for understanding. You're the boss, Jesse, of course. <laughs> and Ray, your question is going to be answered, but right now I'm going to just move ahead to the next speaker. And meanwhile, you know, Fernandez, when he Robert Fernandez, when he comes back, he's going to be responding to that. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So the next speaker for the day is someone who handled a very challenging portfolio. She's also the lucky lady who's soon going to be entering a new phase in her life, the retired life. Needless to say, she would be missed by one and all. Please welcome Nicole Weiss, the Assistant Director, Quality Assurance. We also have Nidra Clayton, a very experienced professional, joining in with Nicole. As you all are aware, Nidra would be taking over the role of the manager in the department on Nicole's retirement. So over to Nicole and Nidra. Thanks, Jesse, for the kind words. And Nidra, wave so everyone can see you. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. I'll be doing most of the talking, so I want to um, give you some hands-on stuff to do. So uh, we start out with our after-hours response team. The after-hours response team is a team of experienced folks, have uh, case managers and intake workers who have been with Valley Martin for a long time and they are staffing phones after hours. So if you have a consumer or a police or hospital needs to get a hold of someone for assistance, they will call the after hours number and uh, the staff will call them back and assist them. And we get all kinds of calls. Uh, hospitals needing consent for procedures and after our staff will contact Claire or Angela to do medical consents. There needs to be assistance if there is a crisis, someone needs to be relocated, that kind of stuff. So what I'm asking all of you, which is very important as you meet with your consumers and have consumer contact, if you find out that one of your consumers might have a crisis and might require assistance after hours, please fill out a crisis contingency form. 
And I believe Jesse has mailed you a whole packet of stuff from me, which should have included the, there we go, the after hours response system crisis contingency form. That will, um, you send that to the after hours email group, AHRS email group. That way they will get it. One of the things you need to know is that our sender system goes down for several hours every night. And that means that my staff cannot, or soon to be NIDWA staff cannot look up uh, information in the system anymore. So they are sometimes have to rely on the after hours response system crisis contingency form. Also, what I ask you to do is if you have a situation where you know, maybe um, you have a single parent being the sole caretaker of a consumer. When you have your meetings with that family, it's a really good idea to have that discussion with them. Should, you know, if something happens to you, what do you want to see happen? Who should we contact? We had had situations where we had caregivers we had consumers living with parents or grandparents falling and hitting their head, being knocked out, find, you know, police cards in the middle of the night because the consumer was running around nonverbal, running around Pershing Avenue in Stockton in the middle of traffic. You know, imagine how scary that is. So when we get the phone call that assistance is needed, it would be really great if we had the phone number of a relative or a neighbor or a friend that we could call and say, hey, you know, um, this, con this person, this consumer of ours really needs some help. And while we can send professional help out, it's always better to have someone there that the consumer is familiar with and um, can assist in those situations. So don't necessarily wait for a crisis to happen. You know, do some preparative work and that really will help your consumer. And I'm trying to talk fast because Tony gave me two times 10 minutes for presentations that normally last a total of over four hours. So, um, but I'm gonna do my best. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is LSRT or the Legal Services Review Team. And uh, again, in the packet you got, there's a whole bunch of information. There's a case management guide. There is a LSRT information sheet. Now the LSRT information sheet when you have a consumer who you find out is involved in the criminal justice system, i.e. was arrested, um, or maybe they were arrested, but sometimes the family was told that the consumer was given a citation or they are about to be arrested, or the police came and you know didn't start an investigation, you need to sign up for LSRT. And the sign up for that is on the P drive under LSRT. And uh, the team so far has met Monday mornings, but um, that might change. So look out uh, if Nidra and the team will change that, then they send an email around. The team consists of Nidra Greg Barnett, who is the senior case management specialist of the deflection team, and the psychologists Barbara Johnson and uh, Justin Schrotenberg. And uh, we get together and we discuss every case. The reason why that's important is because if a person is has an is a consumer of the regional center, there is a whole different aspect to the criminal justice system. And we, it's our responsibility to make sure that our consumers get due process. Now, you might have seen that the little booklet I sent you, the case management guide to uh, 
uh, criminal justice in the de with developmentally disabled individuals is about 80 pages long. So uh, we do not expect you to learn all of that and study all of that. It's more a reference guide when you come to LSRT and you present your case, then LSRT will give you guidance, including on when you need to go to court, how you, you know, what you need to do once you get there. We do send deflection staff members with you, especially at the beginning and in some of the complicated, more complicated cases uh, we walk you from the beginning to the case resolution. Um, you know, one of the consumers who currently is going through the system has been just now charged with um, attempted homicide. So that is not a case that the case manager, we're going to leave the case manager out there handling by themselves. We walk you through that. But I wanted you to have the resource material. You have the long version, and then there is a one-page short version uh, for reference. Um, and by the way, if you have questions, you can send them to me up to, uh, let's say, uh, Monday at 9, because Monday at 11, I'm having my exit interview with Bud and I'll be walking out the doors. So if you want an answer from me, Monday at nine is the deadline, but Nidra has worked with me for many, many years and I fully trust that she is more than capable of answering questions and assist you however you need to be assisted. Another thing that the deflection manager does is facilitate problem solving team. And problem solving team really is a forum for uh, case managers to um, discuss a case. You know, you might have just a bad feeling. You might just have the feeling, ah, oh, something is not quite right in, in this situation. Uh, and you just want to discuss it. And maybe your senior service coordinator or your program manager is not available, or you just want to fresh eyes looking at the case, go ahead and sign up for problem solving team. And we get together, we do have a um, BCBA from UOP who sits in and assists us with cases that are behavioral cases. Um, problem solving team also if you have an issue with a consumer where you think there is something going on maybe sexually and you don't know what other resources are available. Um, we have a psychosexual consultant who does psychosexual evaluations and they go through problem solving team. Um, you, uh, Doug, do you have the form available? There's a sign up form for PST. Uh, let me, is it a PDF or a Word document? Oh, here it is. One sec. So you fill that out, you send it to Nidra, and um, she will let you know when, actually, you, you sign up for, there it is, yeah. You sign up for problem solving team and, um, and you don't have to come in person for neither LSRT nor PST. Do you have to be in person if the meeting is held in an office where you are not physically present once everyone returns to work? We've done it by phone. Nowadays, we probably, or we have been the last few months doing everything by Zoom. Um, so you, you know, if a placement is in jeopardy is one of the big things because sometimes we need to have a discussion on how to maintain a placement rather than as a first option, look at changing a placement. How am I doing in time here? How much longer do I have? You got about five minutes. Yeah, you're on time, five more minutes to go. Of my 10 or my 20? Uh, of the 20. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Time flies when you have fun. So, um, so that's problem solving team. Uh, now, while there are signups and specific time for LSRT and problem solving team, if you have an issue that cannot wait, go ahead and contact Nidra and she can always pull together a special meeting, special get together, pulling in the people that need to sit in because sometimes things just can't wait. Um, finally, I have a couple of minutes to talk about quality assurance. Quality assurance is a very important service that our regional center provides. It's a team of six community services liaisons, and they are assigned uh, day programs, care homes, supported living and independent living agencies. And those, especially care homes and day programs are, um, there, there's a set of regulations and we really don't expect you all to know all the regulations. When I started working with QA, they gave me the binder and it was about this big. And I thought, oh, hell no, you know, I, I, there's no way I can read that thing. Um, so they are a good resource in regards to regulations. So if there's something going on in a care home that you are or day program, ILS program, or with other vendors that you are not satisfied with. For example, um, your consumer reports to you that they are not getting food they like, you know, or that there's not enough food. If it's food they don't like, that should be an ID team discussion with the manager. But if there's not enough food, that would expect um, uh, that would affect all the consumers, and that is a quality assurance issue. So what you would do, you would fill out an alert, and the alert is sent to an alert email group and is assigned to the community services liaison who is uh, responsible for that program. They will make an unannounced visit, they will do an investigation, and uh, if necessary, we'll uh, meet with the care provider. Sometimes we do a substantial inadequacy, so if they are violating one of the regulations and they might be put on sanctions. Huh, this is really way too much for five minutes, um, but it's an important function of the agency and I'm sure eventually you all will have the extended uh, full-blown uh, new employee orientation. So I'm going to close with that. Again, if you have any questions, uh, send them to Nidra, feel free. And uh, uh, I've met some of you and good luck. Um, it's you entered a fabulous organization. I stuck around for over 30 years. So it is a good one. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Nicole or Nidra? I don't see in the chat or Q&A so far. Nicole has some great stories if you can get her to tell some of her stories uh, before, well, before yeah. Monday at 9 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, if you need another two to three minutes, maybe up to five minutes, please feel free to do so. I mean, yeah, I just spoke with Robert and he's been gracious enough. He would, he's giving a few minutes. So if you would like to share something with all of us, um, this is a platform. So maybe another two or three minutes, if you need that, please go ahead. Nothing like being put on the spot when you try to wrap up. Yeah, I have tons of stories, but um, I'm not sure of the best time. So let me just talk about PST, you know, the feeling that, it's very important that you guys develop your spidey sense that something is wrong. So um, we had a situation where I had a uh, 
uh, staff actually from Modesto contact me one day and says, you know, I, I want to sign up for problem solving team. I've been in this home and, and there's just something going on. And I said, yeah, come on, let's talk about it. And uh, she came in and she was telling me about her consumer and who had really increased behaviors. And, um, and then she was telling me about the consumer's sister, a four-year-old little girl. And she says, no, it's really odd because this girl, every time I've been to the house, she's been so uh, eager to meet me and she's playing and she's doing all, um, you know, she's always dancing and laughing. And the last time I was there, she's just not doing this anymore. And I don't know what's wrong. So I, so I asked, I said, so what's going on in the household? You know, have, what have you observed? Is there anything different? And she's like, no, mom is the same. And, you know, and then she says, well, wait a minute. Uh, mom had a new boyfriend move in. You know, big red flag right there. So uh, we ended up, doing a potential abuse um, report. We are our mandated reporter. And while we really didn't have something tangible, but a change in behavior is worthwhile noting. And the, the child, the girl, actually is not our consumer, but still at, as mandated reporter, it was reported, it turned out that the little girl had been sexually abused and ultimately the boyfriend ended up in jail. So, so, you know, develop your spidey sense, don't push down. If you, if you have a feeling that something might be wrong, it's always good to talk it out. If, if you are not comfortable acting on your own, get yourself support. Need was going to be there. Of course, your managers are going to be there. If no one is there, just grab any other manager, anyone to help you as you need, but don't ignore those that sense that something is wrong. And the other great advice I have, get to know your consumers. Really spend time reading the files. You know, um, it is so important that you know a person's history to help them for the future. That's it. Not a good story, but sage advice, if I may say so myself. All right. Thank you very much, Nidra. Thank you very much, Nicole. And wish you a happy retired life and good luck in your journey ahead from all of us here at Valley Mountain Regional Center. So it's not a goodbye, but au revoir till we meet again. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So ladies and gentlemen, it's time now to share the next question for the Starbucks Lucky Draw. So the rules remain the same as you are aware. The question would appear in the chat. It's going to be posted by Doug. And you need to answer on the chat within five minutes. The responses should not be more than five words long. It could be one word, it could be five words, but not beyond five words in order to be considered for the lucky draw. So here comes the second question and your time starts now. Posted now. Yeah. And meanwhile, I'm going to the last presenter of the day doesn't need any introduction because he was there presenting on behalf of Brian Bennett. So it's going to be Robert Fernandez again, Manager Resource Development, who's going to be speaking about residential screening process. And Robert, in case you missed out on something from Brian's portion, please feel free to add that here. So over to Robert, thank you very much. Uh, before I get started, though, I want to make sure that I have a chance to win the Starbucks also. Is that part of the deal? Otherwise, I'm not moving forward. Yes. Everybody yes. who's here, whether you're a panelist, whether you're a speaker, even Tony, awesome. everybody is there. All that you have to do is punch in your responses within the five minutes time limit and don't go beyond five words. That's all. <laughs> That's why I posted what I did on that chat room that you're, you'd be a, a great uh, game show host there, Jesse. Thank you. All right. All right, sorry about that. Um, yes, moving on here. Um, my other topic is residential screening. Um, I am part of the res residential screening team. This may or may not sound familiar to you, but believe me, when you're a service coordinator looking for placement for one of your uh, consumers, 
uh, we are going to be your friend. We, we, we should be your friend, okay? Um, so residential screening team. Let's go ahead and, yes. So what's the purpose of, of residential screening uh, and the committee? Well, it's to assist you, the SC, uh, and or your PM, the consumer and their families to identify possible placement options for both children and adult consumers. Who's on the committee? So we have two committees uh, of residential screening. Uh, one of them is the RS children. Uh, the individuals that are on those that committee is Julie D. Diego, Pam Kodrowski, uh, Katina Richardson. I might be missing someone else and I apologize, but I know those three are the ones who are on that screening committee for the children's group. And then for the adult um, screening committee, it's Marianne Gonzalez, Nija Clayton, myself, Paul Dion, and Jessica Gonzalez. I do want to add that in 2015, prior to 2015, uh, June, excuse me, yeah, June 2015, there was only one person that was doing all of the screening and possible uh, placement options um, prior to that. So now we have eight that are screening uh, referrals for placement. So it's, it's been a big change and I think it's been a very positive uh, change for VMRC and the consumers. What to do? So what you're going to do is if you have a a need for a residential placement, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to review that with your PM. Um, I should have put review that with your PM and or your senior service coordinator. Okay, you're going to complete and submit an internal screening form. I put in quotes the internal because there's also external screening form. But since uh, we're talking to you guys uh, as staff, uh, you're going to use the internal screening form either two and what you're going to do is you're going to complete that form and submit it to either the rs children uh, email group or the rs adult email group obviously whichever one is applicable in your situation uh, what we're going to do as a screening team is we're going to uh, you're going to await for recommendations if any and i will get into the if any component um, afterwards uh, once you receive these recommendations you're going to contact these potential providers and you know you're going to assess whether or not that uh, referral or recommendation is an option for your consumer. Uh, once a recommendation has been made, you're going to make your phone calls or contacts, um, and then you're going to contact uh, the screening team that referred just to give us an update. Uh, we really, really emphasize that you give us an update whether or not. Uh, they accepted your consumer into that home, into that particular facility or not. Uh, we really do uh, want to know um, who was accepted into those particular homes, okay? Important notes. I want to highlight this, these two notes here. The committees only make recommendations. It is up to the SC to follow through with the options. Again, these are only recommendations and so these aren't you know directives that you must contact these providers um, there may be one option there may be several options and sometimes and unfortunately there sometimes there are no options okay when there are no options um in talking back about in, in going back and in, in, in speaking about unmet needs that could potentially be an unmet need submission okay when there are no options but for the most part I would say, I know Nicole and Nidra are on this phone call, but for the most part, we give at least, what, one, one referral recommendation, at least, uh, probably 99% of the time. And that 1%, it's Nicole's fault. So I, I give all that 1% that doesn't get a, an option to Nicole. I'll let her answer that. I'm just kidding, Nicole. I know you're leaving, so I'm giving you a hard time. <laughs> Um, as far as meeting, the committees, we meet two times a week. We meet Mondays and Fridays, um, always, at least once a week. But for the most part, we meet two times a week. Uh, but on emergency placement situations, because we know things just don't happen between Monday through Friday, okay, uh, we review immediately. Once you submit the, uh, the referral form to the team, then we review immediately and hopefully we find a solution or a recommendation. Technicalities, here we go. Um, 
the internal screening form is found there. That's the link. It's on the P drive. I know it's a long link, but I can send this. I could have Jesse and or Doug send this uh, PowerPoint presentation to you guys. Uh, but you can also obviously get this from your manager or your senior service coordinator. So the screening form must be filled out in its entirety, and that's where it can be found. Also, you're probably going to be referring to the vacancy list, and that's also found on the P drive um, to determine whether or not uh, there are uh, vacancies in certain homes. I think there was one um, slide that was left out, but it's okay. Let me share it again. I think I skipped over the second slide. Okay. One sec. Sorry about that. It Thank was, you, Douglas. Uh, this one, the purpose? No. Was it? Uh, when should you refer? Yes. Okay. This one's important. So when should you refer to the uh, uh, residential screening committee? Um, when you are in need of a CPP home, again, we talked about that earlier, community placement plan, a level four, and I put X there because level fours have anywhere between level four A all the way through the alphabet of four I. As long as it's a level four, um, then you can refer to the screening team. If it's a negotiated rate home or it's an ICF, DDN, or H, okay? or a respite placement is needed. So those are the, those are the times that you should refer to the residential <clears throat> screening committee. And again, you've discussed this with your senior service coordinator and or your program manager, excuse me. <coughs> Any questions? Do we have any questions for Robert? Did I win? I don't see any questions so far in chat or Q&A. All right, so if we do not have any more questions, so I would like to thank all the speakers for their valuable presentations. In case of any queries or follow-up information, I would encourage new hires to follow up uh, with the speakers and feel free to communicate with them. I'm sure they would be more than happy to assist. And hope you all found today's session useful and informative. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow again, same time, same virtual Zoom venue. And in case anybody has any questions or anybody wants to share anything, we still have a few more minutes to go. I'm sure nobody minds just wrapping up a little early, but we still do have another 15 minutes. If there are any questions for anybody on the panel or anything that somebody would like to share. Or any more stories from Nicole, if that's what people want to hear. <laughs> All right, so if we have no more questions, nothing more, you know, no other suggestions or stories, I would like to thank everybody for being present for today's webinar. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 9 a.m. And thank you once again and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>